Tucker from Westford Cat. I'm here Zoom recording from my home for our weekly Westford Health Beat with a COVID-19 update. Uh, we have Jeff Stevens, who is Westford's health director, and we have Gail Johnson, who is the public health nurse for Westford. Thanks for coming on, guys. Thanks for having us. Thanks. So Jeff, let's get right into it. Uh, looks like there was a big jump in numbers all over Massachusetts yesterday. Uh, what's going on here in Westford? So yeah, there has been a big jump and I think it's important for everybody to remember that a few weeks ago, uh, the state did predict the peak to be between the day, uh, dates of the 10th and the 20th. And it appears that that prediction is falling pretty close to uh, reality. Uh, it appears that maybe this peak is happening right now, but until we get through it, we're not truly going to know when we're actually past the peak. So uh, right now we're just hunkering down and hanging on and making sure that uh, everybody's doing as well as we can. As far as our numbers go, uh, in Middlesex County, there are 10,724 cases as of yesterday afternoon. That number will most likely go up today after four o'clock. Uh, and locally, we've got 100 active cases, 60, uh, 100 total cases in town, 64 uh, are active and 32 people have recovered. Um, that number jumped up quite a bit over the past week. And a lot of people would really like to know why that's happened. And what I do have to tell people is that all of those numbers do represent a person and those people are patients and patients have rights to privacy. So where they are and how they got to where they're at isn't anything we can share. It's important to know. Uh, it's nobody would want their own personal medical information to be shared with anybody else. And that's why we can share you a number, but we can't tell you who or where. Um, but with those numbers, there's something I'd like for people to really understand. And that is for people to understand how much work goes into the contact tracing. Uh, every time there's a positive case that shows up in the state's MAVEN system, which is the epidemiological uh, virtual network, um, these people uh, are contacted and they're contacted by people like Gail Johnson. Um, and Gail's with us here today, and she's our public health nurse, and she's running not only uh, all the town's cases, she's also helping manage uh, all our school nurses that are helping us out in doing this contact tracing. Uh, we've got five people that are able to get onto this system, so Westford itself is very well equipped to handle this entire case. Uh, so Gail, uh, could you tell everybody what it actually takes to run a single case. Okay, well, first of all, thanks for having me today. Um, it, it takes a lot. So I know you've mentioned this, Jeff, in many previous um, interviews, but there are 351 cities and towns that have, um, some have public health nurses in there and some do not. Like in Berkshire County, we may not have a lot. So the governor, well, let me, before I get into that, what public health nurses do before coronavirus came about, we as public health nurses would get on MAVEN, which is a, a database that I share um, with an epidemiologist at the state lab. And when cases come in, I open up MAVEN, I look at what I have to do as a case investigation, and I will do that. It could be any disease processes, salmonella, campylobacter, et cetera, et cetera, measles, and, and, and now we have coronavirus. And so my job as a public health nurse, as all of us in, our, in public health, call the case. You're positive with, with so we're gonna talk about COVID right now, COVID-19, you're positive with COVID, and my job is to contact the person that's positive and get all the clinical information from that person, the onset of symptoms, find out what the symptomology is and um, put that information into MAVEN. 
in addition, while I'm on the phone with them, I find out who was in contact with them and how they think they contracted COVID. Some don't have a clue and some know definitely they were with somebody that was positive and that then they got sick. So many, many different reasons. So what I do then is write down all of the list of names of, of the people that they were in contact with and then I then call and contact all of them. And so it is a very long process because it's not so simple to just say, I mean, if they live alone in the house, that's great. And they never left. I don't know how they got it in the first place, but there's a lot of contacts and there's a lot of people that follow that one positive. And I spend a lot of time. And because the cases are growing, I have elicited some assistance from um, three very close uh, school nurses that have been helping me. The other school nurses have also been helping with fielding the phone calls that come in. But generally speaking, I have the, the three other uh, school nurses and myself doing the caseload and the contact tracing. What has happened is that maybe I can handle the cases here in Westford, but some of the cities and towns like Boston and Brockton and Chelsea uh, have over 1,200 cases. That is impossible for one individual to handle. There's just no way. Like Lowell has so many cases and they have maybe four public health nurses, but it's still too big, it's too many. So the governor has come up with a group that have what's called the Community Tracing Collaborative. And that is a team of about a thousand people that have been hired to be an assist to the public health nurses in their communities to take those cases and contacts and really do some of the legwork for, um, for us. So what's happening as it's being rolled out through the governor's office, we are um, getting assistance through their, you know, through them. So it's it's a wonderful collaborative that helps public health nursing really be able to to really get all the contacts and the tra and the tracing done. So with their help, and it's through partners in health, they're helping us do that. So it's been a great um, collaboration. Hey Gail, I've got a question for you. If I was to be curious about, say, I heard my neighbor had COVID, if I was a contact, I would have been called, correct? Correct. So close contacts are considered somebody that's closer than six feet for longer than 15 minutes of time. You know, if you walked by somebody and if you were just you wouldn't get, you know, unless you really breathed in a big giant viral load of, of it, if someone had coughed and you breathed it in, but generally speaking, it's more closer than six feet and longer than 15 minutes. And right now, because everything's been shut down, what's, it's basically the people in the house. So, I mean, it's, or if you're a healthcare worker or you work in a, you know, nursing homes or group homes or wherever you're working, you may get it out in the clinical field. Um, first responders out in the clinical field, you know, out in the world. But generally speaking, most people aren't working anymore. <laughs> so um, the, the contacts are usually family members. So Gail, I've got another question. I might not have been sick. Is it possible I still have this? So the data is skewed, and I, <laughs> Jeff and I talk about this all the time. This is our daily conversation. Yeah, I'm baiting you. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it, it's our daily conversation. Because what I know for a fact is when I talk to a positive case on the phone and their family members are also symptomatic but did not get tested, they are presumed positive because they have symptoms of one or, an, or another, but they haven't been tested. So they're presumed, but they're not counted in the data. 
And to you answer your question, all the asymptomatic people that are walking around who we don't know, they have no symptoms and they're spreading. So it used to be droplets where you cough or you sneeze and you got it. But now it's, you know, if you're shedding the virus through just really being around somebody that has no symptoms. So when we talk about data and we are giving you numbers, Jeff, I give him, you know, how many people are in town, he then reports it and so on and so forth. But the problem is, is we're missing a huge statistical group of people, the asymptomatic group, that they don't even know they have it. So thank you, Jeff, for bringing that up. So let me ask you a question. Um, so when you said the, um, you, so someone in town has it, and then you contact people that they've been in contact with, are they required to go and get tested or is it more of an urging or? That's a great question, actually. A great, great question. Um, so here's the thing. You are the case. You are the positive person. If your family members are symptomatic, let's say, I'm just going to talk about the family. So if the family is symptomatic, the doctors don't encourage them to have, if they can be sick and stay at home, that's recommended. Just stay at home and be sick. You know, get over your illness at home. They don't need to be tested. You're just presumed positive. If you're asymptomatic and you're a contact of somebody that is positive, we are saying for 14 days, you're going to stay away from public places and monitor symptoms for, for, for two weeks. So you do not need to be, so, so that's a very good point. So let me bring that up real quick. If you were in contact with somebody who was positive, and I tell you, well, you know what? You were exposed. Let's put you in quarantine for 14 days. And they said, well, I just want to get tested and find out. Okay, if that's what you choose. So let's say day five in that, quarantine period, you get tested and you're negative. The viral load at that time may have been negative. You may not have it at that time. That, however, does not mean that you do not develop symptoms day 12, day 13 or 14. It's as if I sneezed and Patty, you walked by me and you breathed my virus in and you went tested the very, you know, that day or the next day, it would probably be negative. It takes time in your body for that virus to ear its ugly head. And so when you're saying, let me get tested day five, that doesn't mean you're all clear. That means you were negative that day, the viral load was not very high and it didn't pick it up, but it could take 14, up to 14 days to develop symptoms. So we have to be careful about this whole testing thing and thinking you're all bet, you're all set and ready to go when you're not. Gotcha. So how long does the, do, you know, how long does the droplets stay in the air? Say someone coughed, um, like, cause I'm getting takeout sometimes, right? So, you know, you, you pay by, it's, it's, uh, the restaurants are really doing incredible. So, you know, you pay over the phone with your credit card, they pack it all up, they put it in a bag, and they put it in, a, in like a vestibule. And then only one person can go in at a time. You have your name on it, you pick it up, you leave. You know, bring it in the home, you take it off, you, one person holds the bowl, you, another person throws the food in, you throw out all the packages and you know. So, um, but my question is, say someone coughed in that vestibule before me. <laughs> so that's true and it can happen. And so the thing is, is when you, so when I cough or I sneeze, and Jeff and I were talking about this the other day too, we were watching the Today Show and they showed how far a sneeze can, or a cough can go. And it can go up till 12 feet, but that's probably not as typical, but six feet is the general distance. So then when you cough or you sneeze, the droplets then fall and it can live on surfaces and there is an argument of how long, again, testing hasn't been in full force yet, but we do know, however, that it does stay on surfaces. It could be hours or it could be days. 
and you know it depends on the surface right exactly plastic wood right so it's different at different times so the general rule when you're picking up something take out your stuff wash your hands if i can't say enough up to you about washing hands wash your hands wash your hands like all the time yes until they're bleeding but i mean you know but really just keep washing your hands because when you're taking the food out and someone coughed on it you can argue that you could even if it wasn't in those little um you know um, cardboard boxes you know but wash it maybe if it's in a plastic container wash it with soap and water before you even you know if people are cloroxing i'm cloroxing literally my milk all my food <laughs> because I don't know either if it's sitting and how long it's been sitting on the surface for. So best to take your food out, washing your hands. Like that's the best advice. Well, thank you. No, I, that's fine. Thanks a lot. I appreciate that. Patty, I think maybe one of the biggest messages with that information is the wearing of a face covering is going to help reduce the spread of that, that droplet and that, that vapor that you're breathing out. Um, we've said it, a hundred times we'll keep saying it people need to take the responsibility of wearing a face covering when they go out and i'll add to that the reason for that is two reasons for that is one you can just pretend that you're the one that's positive and you don't know it you weren't tested and you're asymptomatic and you're trying to protect other people from getting it flip that and you're also protecting yourself from someone else who may have the virus so it's a two-way street you know the cloth coverings are never a hundred percent but they do decrease the chances at least it's better than having nothing protecting you so i totally recommend wearing something um that will a face covering um to prevent either one of you for spreading the, the um the virus i've got my pink bandana here this is Perfect. my face covering Perfect. Keep it in my pocketbook, and uh, yeah, I just that's what I use. So, frankly, um, I never leave my house. So, so here I am. <laughs> well, I try not to leave my house. I'm not leaving it often. I, I know I what you mean. Left my, I haven't left my house in eight weeks. <laughs> well, I just I like to go for a walk or a drive. I just I have to get that headspace uh, by you know just you need it. Yeah, feeling the sun on my skin. Although it's spring in New England, so you don't get a lot of that. But. <laughs> But um, so anything else that you guys would like to share with uh, Westford residents? I just think it's important for people to just take responsibility for what your actions are. We know people are asymptomatic. There are people that are walking around that don't appear to be sick that could be shedding virus. So be aware that you could be one of those people and just take responsibility for your own actions. Stay home when you can. And if you do have to go out, wear a face covering and keep washing your hands. That's, yeah. I think, all we can ask right now. And also, just for me to just add, I work behind the scenes. <laughs> I'm, I am working diligently with and the other um, three other uh, school nurses. We're working, I am working literally seven days a week, hours on end because I want to make sure that the residents in town are safe and know that they have a public health nurse that's, you know, working in the background for them and, and to reach out to me or Jeff, really, either one, to help answer any questions or concerns. We're here and that's what we're here for, to help. No, thank you. You know, thank you, Gail, and thank you to the three school nurses, and thank you, Jeff. I know this is a really scary time. I just want to ask a couple of more questions. You know, if somebody is positive, I'm sure they're really scared. I mean, but it appears most people, if there's 100 right now in town and 64 are active and we have 32 recovered, I mean, is there anything encouraging that you could say to someone who has been tested positive? It's scary. I would be scared. Well, I so would say if there's anything we can tell you, if you're tested positive and you're sick, the vast majority of people are surviving and recovering from this. Um, if you go on to the state's uh, COVID website, they are now giving daily updates on the amount of cases, the types of people that have had it, uh, the recovery rates, uh, there's um, 
a pretty good amount of information on it. Uh, it's, it's several pages and it breaks down everything from males and females getting it to deaths with a previous hospitalization, uh, deaths with underlying conditions, which is almost all of them. Uh, people with co-infections are, are the, the people that are, have the highest mortality rate. Uh, there's a lot of good information that you can maybe, I don't know if it'll make you feel better about what your current situation is, but there's a lot of information out there that the state puts out around four o'clock every day it's updated. And it's important to know that most people are recovering from when they're getting sick. And there are, we don't even know how many people are carrying the virus that are never going to be sick. Uh, it's, we may never know that number, not until we can do uh, uh, some testing that's not available yet. Uh, but it's, there's, there's a lot of good information on people can get on the types of, the types of people that are, when they are sick, um, what's happening with them. Uh, I would say if, if you are sick, you're most likely going to be fine. But if you get to a point where you feel like you're not fine, get the help that you need. Um, if you feel like you're having a hard time breathing, if you feel like it's really becoming labor intensive, that's when you need to be in a hospital. So those are the things people need to watch out for. Okay, so, great. Yeah, I was just going to add on to that. I mean, uh, as a nurse and I am, a, you know, we're resources for people if they are concerned. We, when we talk to um, these positive cases throughout town, I, we always let them know that we are a resource, we're here for them, we support them, but also not just us, but also their primary care physicians, the nurses in their office. Um, even though if it's remotely being able to talk to their doctors now, but we are a support system. And I tell everybody, we're, not in, we're in this together. You're not alone. There, is there are people that are knowledgeable that can support you. And so I want really, if, if I can leave with anything, letting people know that they can reach out to me and ask me questions. That's, so they're that's, not yeah, that's what, that's what I wanted to know. That's great. Yeah, yeah that's great. Yeah, okay. and if there are people that need to, if they want to get some questions answered, call the health department uh, at 692-5509. And if you scroll through our menu, you will get to a COVID helpline. If somebody does not answer right then and there, uh, leave a message and you will be called back by one of our school nurses. So there's people, if they need answers, we have ways for them to get it. Terrific. All right, guys. Um, you're working hard. Uh, the town appreciates it. And uh, we'll check in again next week. Gail, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Okay, guys. So, thanks, we'll, yeah, I'll talk to you next week, Jeff. And uh, stay safe, okay? You All too. Right. Bye, Patty. All Thank right. You. Bye, guys. For Westford Cat, I'm Patty Stalker.